Well, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon from the Chicago Architecture Center. We are here today celebrating International Museum Day with a number of fabulous architects that work in the city of Chicago. Um, my name is Patricia Garza and I'm Director of Corporate Relations at the Chicago Architecture Center. That is a world-class organization that has been in Chicago serving populations since 1966. And we have a broad program of tours, exhibitions, public programs, including lectures, uh, talks, uh, also uh, a, a comprehensive youth education program that's been around for almost 40 years, through which we work with youth, primarily from underserved communities, help them learn about, um, to, to help them learn about opportunities in architecture and construction, design, engineering, um, urban planning. And so the people around the table here today um, are, are members of our industry council which is comprised of about 95 firms in the city of Chicago representing those industries. And they're here, they're great speakers. They have been involved with our organization for a number of years and we have a, a good um, working relationship with them. So if I could, I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit, just a very little bit about themselves. You'll find more information uh, on the bio page attached to this. So Kim. Hi, and uh, Patricia, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Kimberly Dowdell, and I'm the 2019-2020 National President of NOMA, uh, which is the National Organization of Minority Architects. I'm also a principal at HOK Chicago, and uh, just really delighted to be here. Great. And then uh, Juan, please. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. It's, it's great to be here. It's a terrific honor. My name is Juan Moreno. I'm president and founder of the architecture firm JGMA here in Chicago, whose work is predominantly dedicated to communities of color throughout Chicagoland. Great, thank you. And Ernie? Hi, uh, Patricia. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you, CAC, for everything that you guys are doing uh, in these unprecedented uh, times. Um, Again, my name is Ernie Wong. I'm uh, the found, one of the founding principals of Site Design Group. We're a landscape architecture urban design firm based here in Chicago. This year we are celebrating our 30 years in business, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, but, you know, this, this downturn is, is also shocking. So, uh, yeah, I know it's affecting a lot of communities throughout Chicago and sure. that, uh, like, like Juan, that's one of the things that we're always very concerned with. Absolutely, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all join us today. I know each of you is an established leader in, of your, in your own right, and uh, we're very lucky to have you speak with us to this on this particular topic. We're gonna start today by asking each of you to think about and, and perhaps share with us how it is that your own particular background has brought you to where you are today. How, how has that shaped your experience in this field. And again, we're gonna start with Kim. Sure. Um, so my, my story in architecture really starts uh, when I was around 11 years old. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, so not too far from Chicago. Um, so I will always be a Pistons fan. Um, but yeah. in any case, the, um, so Detroit uh, in, in the 80s when, um, when I was growing up, um, you know, it was really plagued by disinvestment and that really translated into um, you know, somewhat compromised built environment. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so often, and not just in Detroit, but Chicago and many cities around the country, um, you know, communities of color are, are drastically impacted by, uh, by disinvestment. And I think that's playing out in real time during this uh, coronavirus crisis. So, um, but, but back to my childhood story, um, you know, I was in downtown Detroit and I saw this beautiful old um, uh, boarded up building. And I remember, um, you know, having just taken an art class and I learned what an architect did and I was like, oh, if architects fix buildings, then I will become an architect and I'll fix this, this building and, and other buildings around it. So I think, mm. um, you know, that really sparked that interest and, you know, I've, I've gone on to live in lots of other great American cities, including obviously Chicago and New York and DC and Boston. And, um, you know, really just, you know, I, I love cities and I, I love the opportunity to allow um, you know, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to work together to actually help to, um, to facilitate the reinvestment and the, um, you know, the design and, and development attention that these communities, um, you know, are especially deserving of. 
And that's a topic we'll come back to in just a minute. So, um, Ernie? Um, well, my, you know, my parents had immigrated to this country from China in the late 1940s. Um, my father actually had, uh, had a fellowship to study with Frank Lloyd Wright, and, uh, but he couldn't get his visa um, out of China that year in 1946. So in 1947, he gets his visa. He was on his way up to Taliesin, stopped in, Ch in Chicago, and ran into Mies van der Rohe, where he ended up staying <laughs> <laughs> for the, and practicing for the next 40 years. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in, in my dad's office. Uh, you know, I like to joke that my dad was probably much more German than he was Chinese. Um, and, and he instilled a sense of principles and, 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 uh, and uh, discipline, I think, in, in the work that we do. Uh, he wasn't particularly happy that I went in the direction of landscape architecture. He always thought that I would be a much better architect. Uh, but I was really fascinated working in his office uh, by the social impact of public spaces. And that's what really got me going uh, and interested in, in designing public spaces and the urban fabric of our cities. So uh, we continue to do that and it's, it's really important. Um, and it's gonna to continue to be important. That's great, thank you for sharing that. Juan? Thanks, Patricia. So I was born in Bogota, Colombia and uh, my family immigrated to California in my youth. And um, Kimberly, I must say, I'm a lifelong Laker fan, but we- Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> we can stay to that later. But um, I, um, I found it interesting as I was growing up in LA that, um, you know, I, I didn't speak English with a Spanish accent, yet as soon as I mentioned that I was Colombian, uh, usually I, that followed with some kind of negative stereotype. And um, that marks you as a child. And uh, it certainly motivated me and inspired me throughout my life. Um, and certainly being raised in a single parent family, my mother was the one that really was the reason why we stayed in the United States, why she uh, really encouraged my brother and I to study and ultimately become the first in our family to go to higher education. Um, so watching those things certainly um, leaves a mark on your life. Um, then I had the great fortune of studying at uh, Cal Poly Pomona, where um, one of my first jobs was with the former professor, Judith Schein, and she dedicated herself to community-based work. And during that process, I can remember working on a, an apartment, a co-op, an apartment co-op, I had a chance to meet some of the residents, and I found it really interesting because all of them were shocked that they were meeting an architect. Mm -hmm. And I, I never thought of it as being, look, this is a special profession, but we're human beings. And um, I never thought of us being on a different platform, if you will. And I found that throughout my career, that has remained constant. The amount of individuals that I've met, that's the first time that they've met an architect. Now, coincidentally, that's when I go into communities of color. So when I moved to Chicago over 20 years now, over 20 years ago, um, I found myself being drawn to Chicago's communities and constantly asking the question, why isn't this the place of the best architecture? And ultimately that's what motivated me because as I followed what was going on in my country and I, I go to Colombia regularly, uh, I, I've been able to see all the difficulties that have occurred there, and yet there's been a renaissance, if you will. And uh, the renaissance is occurring partially because of design and the positive impact design has had on people and place and what that's doing to Colombia's youth. And um, certainly that inspires my work. And uh, you know, it's what I, I try to do every day. That's great. And I think that really does bring us back to the question that Kim raised at first, which is the question I'd like to pose for you. What is the role of architecture and design in building a more inclusive and just world? What is that role and how, how do we go about making that happen? No, it's real, I, I think it's really important that 
uh, we recognize that, you know, in, in my particular field, landscape architecture historically has been about uh, designing, the, designing for the uber rich. Uh, everything from the English gardens and the French gardens in Europe uh, were always for royalty. And that kind of passed down, um, you know, through the centuries. And, and we need to understand that quality design, good design, is not just for the rich. I think it's for everybody. And we start to recognize that with the work that is being done in uh, some of these challenged neighborhoods that brings hope and, and livelihood to these communities. And it kind of builds on that to be, be you know, that becomes the, the spark that starts other good things happening. Of course, and, and, and you see what not investing in design or good architecture can do over decades, right? And that's, what, that's when you have a lot of the plight. Anybody else would like to add to that point? Yeah, I would say the other role of architecture and architects is not to underestimate people and communities. So uh, I would argue that the greatest thirst for design in our cities is not just in the downtown area. It's in the inner city. It's in our communities. Um, they love it. It's just that it's not often that somebody comes in and talks to them about their interests and what inspires them. And so, I mean, I, I often talk about this, that um, the design in our communities of color is this terrific platform of innovation. And when you tap into the people and to the minds of the people as architects, we're inspired continuously with the ideas that come out of these get togethers with individuals. And the other side of it is for architects to not stereotype when they go into these neighborhoods. So if you go into a, a Mexican neighborhood, for example, they're not begging for architecture that reminds them of Mayan ruins. Mm -hmm. they're, what they're asking for is innovation like anybody else would, anybody of any socioeconomic background, that talk to me about architecture that inspires, that understands people of the community, that can uplift, that in areas that have been in, disinvested, when you see something that'll cause an emotional reaction with you, and you can feel something positive going on because that resonates throughout a community. And it also resonates from generation to generation where people feel good about where they live. Well, that's clear from even the conversations we're having right now. Kimberly. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, it's so important to really include the, the voices and, and opinions of the people who are, you know, in the communities that are being, um, you know, contemplated for, uh, the redevelopment or even smaller interventions. You know, I truly believe in the, the genius of the local. So, you know, I, I think it's critical that um, architects and designers and, you know, even developers for that matter, um, you know, that they are very um, conscious of, of the, the way that they approach the community, the way that they engage the, the community and ensure that, you know, there, it's a, the, the communication is a, is a two-way street. It's not just about presenting this is what's going to happen to you, it's about what are we going to build together? And I think that's really critical. Um, I mean, the, the professional um, sort of mission of, of an architect is to protect the health, safety and welfare of the public. And I think that, um, you know, taking that seriously means including sort of the social and emotional well-being of, of inhabitants, um, you know, beyond just the, the physical building infrastructure. Yeah. Kimberly, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and that is one of the things that I, I think is really important in uh, education, quite frankly. In our field, they don't teach us how to listen. And I think that's really an important factor that, uh, you know, as professionals, you learn how to do that. But that's after numerous years of practicing. And I think that needs to start at a very early time that, you know, we start to learn to listen and hear from the public and from these different communities as to what their issues are and how do you solve that uh, through, through design. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a, a valid point made by all of you. My background is not in architecture, it's actually in social work and I've been really amazed to understand that uh, a lot of the same approaches in terms of 
coalition building in terms of really listening to the end user in terms of involving people in creating solutions to the issues that they find and that they want to solve that's that's what that's what's really critical and so i was really surprised that that's what happens in architecture yeah patricia i i would agree with ernie is that you know it's it's fascinating when you listen what you can learn and for those that think that the best ideas come strictly from architects, they're missing the point. I, Absolutely. I often, you know, this project that we recently completed on the South Side with Ernie, by the way, where I was, I was meeting with the community and um, it's an affordable housing project. And I was just trying to understand how they live, not how I live, but how this group of artists lives. And, um, the, the common thread there was they all talked to me about quality of space and quality of a living environment. And they were very direct in telling me, Juan, we don't care about granite countertops and stainless steel appliances. And it, I, I always say that, this is incredibly refreshing as an architect to hear that, right? The antithesis of the way apartments are marketed these days but they would point to a small window on a wall and say, why can't we have more of what mother nature gave us? Why is it that windows are always a value engineering alternative? And that, that gave birth to the idea for a building of why can't a building be an exploration in natural life? Without that conversation, I can tell you that building would have never turned out the way it did. And that inspiration strictly from the people that live in that neighborhood. Right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't come in with your own solutions with a, a person of wealth and say, here's what we've got for you. You would involve them in the conversation and you should do no less in these communities is what I think. Um, so you've, you've touched upon this a little bit, but maybe can you think, what would you think, what would you say is a success story that you've had in some of this coalition building. And Juan, you just talk, talked about one, but maybe can we have another example of a success story that you might have had using this approach? Sure. I mean, I mean I've been pretty well versed in this, this way of thinking from the very beginning of my career. Uh, in fact, I remember meeting uh, Commissioner Maurice Cox 15 years ago when we uh, co-founded an organization called SEED together. SEED stands for Social Economic Environmental Design. And um, you know, the SEED mission is to advance the right of every person to live in a socially, economically, and environmentally healthy community. And from the very beginning, 15 years ago, um, I remember uh, at, a, at a meeting, uh, Maurice said that nothing about us without us is for us. And that really has stuck with me throughout the majority of my career at this point. And, um, you know, that resonated with me in one of my very first projects out of architecture school was working on a, a project for Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., which is the nation's premier school for the deaf. And, you know, being a hearing person, um, I was really curious about what the deaf experience, uh, you know, was like and, and how designing space for the deaf would differ from, from that um, of hearing people. And, I mean, it was a fascinating experience. And just to, um, you know, to be a part of those meetings with, you know, um, you know, those of us who could hear talking and then the, the translator translating between, um, you know, American Sign Language and, and, um, and, and our, our voices. I think it was just a tremendous experience that, you know, really allowed them to, to feel as though their, their words mattered. And, you know, the design ended up, um, you know, incorporating so many of the, the elements that they discussed. And even more recently here in Chicago um, uh, at, at HOK, um, we, we partnered with several other firms um, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Chicago Central Area Committee and, and World Business Chicago Initiative to, um, to help um, provide a commercial corridor study for the Little Village community. And Little Village community, I think uh, most people will know, is a predominantly Hispanic community, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar, you know, with, uh, with the, the Little Village area, but going to community meetings and, and talking to, um, you know, talking to the community, even trying to, to speak a little bit of Spanish. Um, you know, I think it was just, it was really helpful um, for me to, to kind of get to know what the issues were so that, so that our team, you know, could go back and, and work on a commercial corridor plan that would, you know, help to reinvigorate 26th Street and to, um, and to allow uh, just their voices to be heard. 
um, instead of us coming in and saying, well, this is what a typical commercial corridor plan includes. And so this is what you're going to have. Like, no, that's, that's not at all how it works. It's more so what are some of the issues? How can we help, you know, reduce issues of, of crime? How can we, you know, spur additional economic activity? How can we, what are the problems so that we can help solve them through design? Right, right. Have you experienced other coalition uh, building with other firms, Ernie? What has been your experience with that? So it's been really funny. We, um, you know, our firm is actually known for a lot of the, the large um, public parks that we do, uh, as, as well as some of the, the uh, planning projects that we do that affect all, a lot of neighborhoods. But for me, the joy really comes in some of the small interventions. And this comes through, you know, various neighborhoods from Lincoln Park to uh, Pilsen to, you know, to uh, Holman, uh, which has been really exciting to see the small things that we can do with a really, really low budget. So I'll take, for example, in Lincoln Park, we did the Lincoln Hub, which is um, right on the corner of uh, Wellington, uh, Southport, and uh, is a triangle uh, uh, in Lincoln Avenue. And the, the community there, the Chamber of Commerce, was looking to do an intervention to try to uh, revitalize Lincoln Avenue with their retail. And we ended up doing paint, a bunch of dots on the pavement to kind of help with the pedestrian flow. It was a really, really small budget, but in doing so, we really helped out and started uh, you know, giving some hope to, to that retail quarter. Uh, and it's really helped out a lot. Uh, the project we did in Pilsen was a small little traffic triangle. We built a park in six, day, uh, six hours with Timberland Boots and uh, with them sponsoring it, along with the organization called the Student Conservation Association. Um, you know, those are the things that involve the community. They take ownership in it. And now that's been really well kept. And everybody continues to call and say, hey, what about this idea? What about, you know, and it's that small coalition building that really makes an impact. That's great. That's great. Patricia, I would say that I'm glad you asked successes because it makes us reminisce and think about some of the past experiences. And um, not only that project on the south side that I was referring to, the housing project, um, that one, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it for many reasons, but I'm also equally proud that that's a project on Chicago's south side in a predominantly African-American community. That, that project received applications from Chicagoans throughout the city to live there. Oh, wow. To me, that is a beautiful success. That is a, a small step in trying to connect our segregated city through architecture. Right. And I think also about, I, I remember working on an elementary school on Chicago's Southwest side and one that I spent a lot of time mentoring you. And I can remember meeting some of these elementary school students walking into the building for the first time telling me it feels too nice. Well, feeling too nice then started to become attendance rates were around 99%. And then those attendance rates became questions and emails to me saying, you think I could study architecture? That then became some of this youth and one in particular went on to study at my alma mater and is currently studying for her AREs. I mean, these are just stories of a lifetime and what makes our profession so incredibly special. But I mean, I could go on and on. There's, when, when you work in communities, you have a chance to connect with people in such a special way and leave very tangible marks on their life and, and improve their lives in ways that you never dream of. You know, you may go in optimistically with these ideas, but the, the community surprises you in so many ways that enrich our lives. I have a, a health clinic on Chicago's Southwest side called Esperanza. Which means hope in English. Which means hope in English. And um, it doesn't look like a health clinic, but I don't know what a health clinic is supposed to look like. All I know is that 
from the moment it opened, they started receiving applications from medical professionals to work there. How great, especially in times that we're all living through right now, that a building in its own small way can inspire people to want to work there. I can also tell you on a very, very personal level, it is where we take our four-year-old son to his pediatrician and from the moment he started going there, he never cries because he just loves the feeling of being there. And I think those are incredible success stories and, and power, powerful moments of design that um, we can't lose sight of. These, these are will, all um, great um, examples. I, I will tell you that I follow Juan around throughout <laughs> the entire city and the work that he does. Uh, one of the first projects that we did with him was the UNO schools and the impact that that made on those communities um, just, just incredible. And, yeah. and uh, uh, the work you do, Juan, is just fabulous. And um, it, it continues to get better. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. It's really exciting to hear each of you talk about these things. because It's that inspiration that people want out of their environment. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask Kimberly if she could speak a little bit uh, specifically because 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 of your role in NOMA as the president of the National Organization of Minority Architects to talk a little bit about the difference between diversity and inclusion and, and how that um, how that affects this conversation, how that plays into the conversation we're having right now. Sure, happy to do that. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was uh, in a um, seminar and I remember a woman named Tanya Allen who leads the Skillman Foundation in Detroit sharing one of the most simple yet profound statements. She said, diversity is about counting the people and inclusion is about making sure that the people count. And um, you know, I, that always stuck with me because you know, it is true that metrics are, are important in terms of, you know, measuring how we're doing in, in the profession of architecture, for example, relative to diversity. So um, I guess to be more specific, uh, there are roughly 115,000 licensed architects in the U.S. Of that number, about 2,300 are African-American, uh, which is just under 2%. And it's been a 2% um, sort of figure for as long as we've been counting for the most part. And so, yes, we do have to, to count um, to make sure that we're making progress, but at the same time, um, you know, inclusion is about making sure that people, you know, have voice. They're, you know, they're at the table. They're able to elevate in their careers. They're not relegated to to doing certain types of assignments because of their, you know, racial or ethnic background. And so, I just think it's important to have to have both of those working in tandem to ensure that both the the people are are there to be representative, uh, because ultimately, as, as authors of the future of the built environment, architects. Um, you know, are, are crucial to, uh, to the way that our, our cities are, are shaped um, and our cities involve all of us. And so it should be, I think the profession should be more representative of, of the communities that we serve. Uh, so that's why I think um, both diversity and inclusion are, are um, very critical and they work together. Great. And Ernie, you've done, you've done terrific work all over the city, all over Chicago and beyond. I, I, I love all of the different examples of the, of the work that you've done. Um, how have you how have you used some of these uh, uh, approaches and in involving people to help have them help you design the work that you're doing? Say some of the work around um, um, some of the work that you've done around Chinatown. I know you've done a lot of work in that area. Now that continues to be, um, you know, I like I like to brag about Chinatown being. The, the architectural mecca of the city of Chicago, which is a pretty darn big statement, right? Um, <laughs> we've, we've had buildings by Jeannie Gang. We've had buildings by Land Bone Baker. We've had buildings, um, we, we've had buildings by uh, SOM, you know, that have really made an impact in that, in that community, uh, which has really uplifted uh, that community in ways that you can't even imagine. It's been interesting, the work that we've done in, uh, you know, and myself personally uh, in Chinatown has been really interesting because I'm not from that community. I grew up in the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Hyde Park, you know, uh, predominantly African-American community. And, and that was, you know, that was what I grew up with. Uh, and so even being accepted in the Chinatown community was difficult for me. 
And so to start that, but yet have this part that really speaks to the community's needs and really starts to, uh, and the streetscapes that occur that, uh, that we've done in the past and we're continuing to do uh, really are important. And it's really important right now because that community is suffering uh, mm -hmm. like you wouldn't believe. I mean, throughout this COVID virus thing, the people were staying away from Chinatown I was there yeah. two weeks ago, two o'clock in the afternoon, which is usually the busiest time in Chinatown after dim sum lets out. There was nobody there. There was yeah. absolutely nobody there. I was taking photographs of empty streets. Whether those businesses are gonna come back, I really don't know. But it's uh, um, really, you know, the, the work though, the public spaces, I think, are a way that um, every culture, every race, every religion kind of has a commonality because they recognize that a public space from home and they feel safe in those, in those spots. So that's really important to, to us and the way we look at that, uh, those spaces. And then we start to formulate the identity of what that mm -hmm. community is around that. That's exciting work. That's really exciting. Um, Juan, I know that uh, the Centro that you created for uh, Northern Illinois um, campus has been really exciting. How has that affected the community around it? I think that's been an award-winning design yeah. that you did of El Centro. So um, I think it's, it's worth noting that the landscape architect of that project is also on this call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Patricia, that's a, a project that um, continues to inspire and enrich my life in ways that surprise me. And um, so it's the, the project for Northeastern Illinois University, the El Centro campus, is one that just the whole mission of the project, the idea of building a satellite campus of higher education and putting it in a place where minorities would access it easier through public transportation. That as a premise was just unbelievable. And then when you start to dig deeper and understand the history of El Centro on the campus, you start to hear things like, well, you know, El Centro used to be borrowed space in a high school, not even exist on the main campus. And they would have challenges of bringing faculty there. Now, their facility has no issues getting faculty to teach there. And it's not just a facility for Latinos. You walk through those walls and you see all socioeconomic backgrounds. So what more could you ask for? I mean, it is like success story after success story after success story. And one that I think it's wonderful because what you see is so many first generation minorities taking that incredible leap of faith and stepping foot into higher education. I mean, these are the ways that we break shackles of poverty and, and give people a chance. You know, I, I'm very drawn to that university. I always will be. It, it happens to be one that it's a building I'm very proud of and continue to be very proud of. But it's also one that, you know, I have a lot of personal feelings. It's a place that I started a scholarship in my mother's name for minorities to travel. Just two weeks, go wherever you want. I don't need all the reasons. I just want you to live out a dream that I've been able to live out. See the that's, world. That's tremendous. That is really a gift. And, and I feel very fortunate to have been the architect of that project and one that, um, you know, I, I like to lead by example, and most importantly, I always want to pay it forward. I, I will tell you that, that uh, the opening day, I was so inspired by one of the alumni of uh, Northeastern Illinois, um, a guy, the former Congressman Luis Gutierrez, who just yes. was just so dynamic and the things that he brings to the table. Uh, just incredible and it was it was really inspiring that's great well clearly all of you are 
champions of just helping people fulfill their aspirations and their dreams. And that is what this work is essentially about. What more can we can be done? And this can be a really creative conversation, but what more can be done to increase diversity in these areas, in urban planning, in landscape architecture, in architecture and design in general, construction, engineering. These are all very important professions that we're all involved with and engaged in. What more can be done to really increase diversity in these in these professions? Well, I, I often quote um, Dr. Marianne Wright Edelman, who uh, once said, or maybe more than once, has mm -hmm. said, um, you can't be what you can't see. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's so critical that um, young people are able to see themselves in uh, in professions that, you know, maybe are not necessarily, um, uh, you know, traditionally available to them. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the numbers of, of African-American architects. I mean, I'm um, black female architect in America, number 295. Like, I know that number because there are so few of us, right? And so, um, so I think that uh, some That's of the- That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I didn't know the number because there's just so many that's like hard to keep count, but it's very easy to keep count, which, you know, we're working on. So just a couple of things that we're, we're doing with NOMA is, um, you know, really focusing on, on the youth uh, to ensure that they do have uh, examples that they can look to and, and mentors that they can call upon. Um, for Since 2005, we've had a program called NOMA Project Pipeline, which is a, uh, a camp for middle school and high school students uh, led by, you know, one of our 30 chapters around the country. Uh, Chicago actually has one of the, the most robust uh, chapters with over 100 kids served every summer. And uh, there's also a design build program, you know, specifically geared towards, you know, getting those kids, um, you know, the much needed exposure to the profession. And, you know, I think that the same applies to, um, you know, not just architecture, but to landscape architecture and engineering, construction. Um, I know with HOK, we, uh, we participate in the ACE mentor program around the country. And so for those who aren't familiar with ACE, uh, it stands for Architecture, Construction, Engineering, and it's geared towards uh, getting high school kids, you know, in the city exposed to those, uh, to those areas. So I just, I mean, I think there's so much that, you know, the various professions can do to really provide that early exposure, because once that seed is planted with the, with a young person, you know, they can take it and, and make it their own, especially as long as they continue to have uh, the support of mentors, and that's something that, that, um, that, that NOMA feels very passionately about. But, you know, even outside of the context of NOMA or the AIA or the Ch Chicago Architecture Center, um, I think it's important that individuals take on the responsibility of seeking out, um, you know, maybe one or two mentors, uh, you know, every once in a while to just make sure that they stay connected to those uh, young people and make sure that they have someone they know they can call upon. That's good. I've, I've been giving out um... Kimberly's contact information to <laughs> all of the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, committees that I sit on throughout the country uh, and the work that she's doing. And I totally agree. It's a recruitment of these, of these kids. Um, mm -hmm. One of the stories that I always tell, you know, when, when I go into these communities and kids ask you, um, the first question they ask is, how much do you make? Which is a difficult question in this, in this profession. Uh, and, and somehow we've got to come to terms with that in order to get the fees up and people getting paid. Um, so that's equitable in, in line with doctors and lawyers and, and you know, people mm -hmm. in business. Uh, that, that's really important. I think that the work that we do that's is true. seriously important and, and it needs to be, reflect that. So um, that's part of the recruitment though. Patricia, I would, I would add that um, you know, part of what I try to do in my leading by example is I, I'm a proud leader in this profession. I'm a proud leader in design that happens to be Latino. And um, I'm one that when I pursue work, I, I don't want to be hired just because I'm Latino. I want to be hired because I'm good at what I do. And uh, when I pursue work, and when it involves collaboration, I want to have an equal share. I want to have an equal share of voice. I want to have an equal share of involvement. And yes, I want to have an equal share of profit. Because of when we talk about equity and we talk about, because this is a great platform that you've put together, Patricia, because we're also talking about architecture. And we, took, we talk about participation of minorities. 
which is wonderful as a program, as a starting point, but there are challenges inherent in it and challenges such that it blurs the lines between engineers and architects. Completely different. And so if you look at Chicago and what's occurred in Chicago, that program has created some mega engineering firms. Which program? The Minority Business Enterprise, the MBE program. Mega engineering firms, successful and absolutely deserving. But there's not a single minority owned architecture firm that has grown to those levels. Because what happens? When there's a requirement, an architecture firm will get their percentages by hiring the engineering firms. They're not going to give away their profits and hire a firm like mine to share in it with me. And um, I think that's something that needs to be put on the table and discussed because we as architects, entrepreneurs, need to be able to get back into the community to this youth and see what's possible and understand exactly what Ernie just mentioned. When they ask you, what do you make? It's a very real response. This is not a field about how much we make, but it's a field that's absolutely incredible as a journey. And we have to give this youth a full understanding of the potential of what a career in architecture can be like. Most of which don't think about architecture. So those of us that can talk like them or look like them or have similar backgrounds, and there's many of us, there needs to be many more. If given the opportunity, we can connect with this youth and expose them to a field that's pretty wonderful. They just don't get a chance to be exposed to it very often. So talking about that there might be diversity and inclusion, but that doesn't always lead to equity. And that's a concern. That's something we still need to continue to work on. I'd like to touch base just for a minute about some of the work that we do at the Chicago Architecture Center that all of you have been involved with. One of those is, of course, our internship program. And Juan, you've, you've hosted interns. And I think HOK has also hosted interns. I believe that site has also in the past. Um, you know, these are great opportunities for our youth to really come to terms with and understand what goes on in design, what goes on in an architecture firm. Uh, and it's added a lot of value to their, uh, th their evolution over time. A another program is the Girls Build program. And um, Kim, you talked about being, you know, one of 295 uh, architects, women architects. Well, we we learned a while back that so many girls really dropped um, math, you know, math related programming uh, early, like in uh, middle school, because they want, they want to pay attention to the guys and they don't want to pay attention to math. And so that's, that's the area, that's the, the time frame that we work with them on in Girls Build. And we invite them to come in and we, we, uh, they, they do design build, they learn about women architects in Chicago and their history. Um, and they learn about, about, you know, how to do scales and, and, and do modeling and all of that. Um, and they love it. I mean, we've, we've had class after class after class being uh, completely, uh, you know, fill, full with, with applicants and, and usually have more than enough applicants to fill the class. Um, so that's, that's a program that we have that we're very excited about. Uh, and then we've also had our teen fellows where, it's a prolonged um, involvement with us, uh, two to three year, where they learn about architecture and, and go through a progressive plan of learning and, and doing. Um, and so I just wanna mention that you guys have been involved with those and those are things that we're also very proud of at the Chicago Architecture Center. So yeah, I, would, I would add that, um, you know, the CAC has been so supportive of, of NOMA over the years. Um, during our 2018 conference here in Chicago, uh, CAC hosted us for, um, you know, for a series of events and, um, you know, just generally been a great partner through the years. And so I just wanted to publicly thank you for your support of not That's just NOMA, great. but so many, great. so many different uh, organizations around the city that, you know, love the space and, and use it and um, use it really to inspire the future uh, generation of architects. So 
Well, thank fun. you for mentioning that we do have a new center here in Chicago, relatively new, really. It, it opened up at the end of uh, 2018 with all of your all of your guys' help, uh, and we are very proud of it. And I think it is uh, a place that really lifts up architecture, design. Uh, it really brings forth how Chicago is the city of architecture. We've got a, a great model on the first floor, and we've got terrific examples of work that's going on not just in Chicago but throughout the world that's been that's been created by Chicago architects on our main floor. Um, it's very exciting and we can't wait to have everybody come back. <laughs> it's uh it's been a uh, uh it's been a challenging time but um our team has really um turned things around very quickly and uh, people can go to architecture.org, which is our website, to learn about all of the programming that you can find that's going on virtually right now. Because uh, we've, we've, we've very quickly switched to having all of our programs done virtually. Uh, Ernie just presented a program last week on um, you know, the safe use of public spaces. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Ernie, what you presented on. Yeah, it was, it was interesting about, uh, we had, were talking about um, public engagement in this time of pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. which is really important. When you start talking about the outreach to these different communities, the equity there is not what you would think. I, I, it, it's really uh, interesting when you look at the data of people who participate in public engagement, it's only about 10% of all adults. And of that 10%, the majority of them are white males that have an agenda that love to hear themselves speak. Uh, you know, in a public setting. And so it's really, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're starting to, to uh, try to figure out. And the biggest thing here is, you know, when you look at 96% uh, of the population has internet access, but nearly 99, almost 100% have cell phones. It's the social media, I think, that's Thank really you. gonna make the impact. And that's one of the things you guys are doing really well uh, using social media as a platform to do outreach and to get people involved. Uh, so th that's got to continue and we've got to ramp that up. We, we are, that is really our goal um, to continue to do, we're doing tours virtually right now. So you can get online and find a tour being done by one of our famous docents that's taking guiding tours downtown and other places. We want to expand that to the neighborhoods because we think there's a lot of opportunity to have people learn more about their local neighborhoods um, and, and, and follow tours there. We're doing, like I mentioned, public programs and lectures and programs like this all virtually. We're presenting um, projects that uh, families can share with young people, youth, uh, children, as well as teens through, through in virtual ways. So uh, we are moving in those directions and it's something that we need to continue to do, but we also need to have the funding support to make that happen. It can't just sort of magically appear as we all know. So um, are there any closing comments that anybody wants to make at this time? I wanted to also give you a shout out, Patricia, and the work that you guys do, because um, one is that through your programs, things like your Open House Chicago, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty beautiful that you do go into the communities mm -hmm. and you highlight architecture in neighborhoods that most people aren't exposed to. And I think that's something that you guys proudly do. So it's great to see that year after year, you continue to include the work in the neighborhoods. I think the other thing, you know, mentioning programs that you offer where you have incredible speakers like Ernie, you've also been wonderful in supporting the Latino cause because you're the first organization that has ever asked me to do a presentation in Spanish. And I think that's the beautiful kind of outreach that you guys provide. And um, to this day, that remains the only time I've been asked to give a lecture in Spanish. Um, just coming back to your, your program for the high school students, you know, I, I think that is one that um, is worth mentioning again because the youth that we have met in our office that come out of your programs, this is special talent. High school students that intern in offices of architecture that are not spending their days folding paper. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Participants in an architectural office, and there's not a single person that has come through my office 
from your programs that we view as a high school student. That's and terrific. Because of the way you prepare them, and they are, they have their gifts and they're incredibly wonderful. And we, we continue to be, and will remain dedicated to the work that you guys do. Thank you, thank you very much. And I know that HOK also has been involved in our internship program and we appreciate that. We, we count on the support of all of our member, um, industry council members to help us with those programs, to help us mentor youth, um, to help us uh, judge. We, we have uh, jurors for our um, new house competition. Our new house competition has been around for almost 40 years. And Ernie, I think you're familiar with Senator Newhouse? I, I grew up with Senator Newhouse's kids, yeah. um, and, and it's just, it was an honor to, to, to know him as a child, um, and, and just the impact that he made for this program and for CAC is just amazing, uh, and it continues to do fantastic work. Um, so we, we just got to come out of this uh, with, with a lot of hope and, and, um, and get kids moving again. Of course. Any final words from you, Kim? Yeah, I would add that, you know, while we are definitely in the midst of very uncertain times, you know, there are certainly things that we uh, can do to reach out to, to young people. And so if, if people want to get involved, you know, reach out to CAC, reach out to NOMA, reach out to AIA. Uh, you know, there's so many organizations that are dedicated to, um, you know, to the future of, of architecture, the future of our built environment. And those are, uh, you know, those are people who are currently children and, and they are um, yearning for uh, for things to do because you know we're all stuck in the house right and so um, just just imagine how great it would be to you know to have a conversation with with Ernie or Juan you know while they're um, you know while they're in their their living room um, and so <laughs> it might be good to do to, to set something like that up yeah. but it's been a pleasure speaking to you guys today. Um, I think we're very honored to have you be part of our extended team. I think Chicago is very lucky to have all of us as part of its fabric. And I look forward to continuing to work with each of you and with us collectively to create a better, better future for our city and for our country and for the world. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Take care.